Hey, good morning. Uh, so we're out here today at Pearl Harbor Historic Sites. We've come out to experience the, as it says, historic site of Pearl Harbor and understand uh, what happened there back in uh, back in the 1940s. Um, understand the significance of the attack on Pearl Harbor and the repercussions that that had on the war, the Second World War as a whole, and just get an understanding of the US Navy and the force that is behind it. Um, so we're going to go inside, experience everything that it has to offer, see what we can see and uh, really get a history lesson I hope. Um, so if you guys do enjoy the video throughout, give us a thumbs up, do appreciate it, it really does help us out a lot and I'd love for you guys to hit the subscribe button bell icon to be notified when we post all new videos. Let's get inside. To get information you've got a passport to Pearl Harbor and that gets you on everything here that is $90. Uh, or 95 if you do a seven day ticket. You've got uh, Battleship Missouri, which is $35. Uh, you've got Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, which is $26. You've got Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum, which is $22. And then you've got the Visitor Center Audio Tour and Virtual Reality Experience, which is $18. All just one or two cents shy of those prices. Um, but $90 for the whole thing, that's not too bad. By the time you add it all up, uh, you save yourself a few dollars. So just to the right of the ticket office, which, this is the Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum. We're going to go and take a right and we're going to get a shuttle over to Ford Island. So first up on our tour, after getting the shuttle bus, now the shuttle bus takes about 10 minutes to get here. Uh, we're going to go into the battleship Missouri. Uh, this is a memorial, it's a full scale battleship it is a battleship it's not like a replica or anything very exciting so here you've got a flag lining the side of the battleship for each of the 50 states of the USA I'm gonna go to the left to the entrance of the battleship so as you come around you've got a little gift shop you've got some souvenir photos and you've got uh, food and drink here as well. They are sort of in Dole Whip, of course, and shave ice. We're in Hawaii, gotta be done. And we're just gonna go up here. We've got to queue up here to get onto the ship and then walk up some stairs. There is an accessible entrance just down the end, so if you need accessibility, go right rather than left when you come in. Here we are crossing over, going over the bridge onto the USS Missouri. So here you have the upper main deck of the USS Missouri. So you see the gun turrets themselves. You've got three of these on board. You've got two up front, one at the aft. So as we come down here, just where you see the large group of people there, that was where the treaty was signed. So just here up on the deck we've got a, an image here of the treaty signed in between uh, the US and the Japanese when the Missouri was anchored in Tokyo Bay. Now uh, General Douglas MacArthur, who you see seated, uh, he was actually part of the US Army, but he was classed as the supreme commander for the Allied power, so that'll be the US, uh, New Zealand, UK, various European countries as well. And that was signed basically here on this deck. So I guess that's why. Where this plaque is. Over this spot on September 2nd, 1945, the instrument of formal surrender of Japan to the Allied powers was signed. Just thus bringing to close the Second World War. So interestingly, uh, it was actually at a different time, we ended it in Europe in May, and it was ended over here in the West in September. So it's very interesting as a European getting this perspective of it. And we've got replicas of the treaty, obviously the English version, signed by the etc. And you've got a Japanese version signed. And here we've got a few images that are taken during that time. Look at the sheer amount of people that are watching on because that is sort of 
that's the end of the war, everybody wanted to see it. 23 minute ceremony to uh, end the Second World War in the West. Okay, so we're just going to go down into the second deck interior visitor route. So we've got the cruise mess galley and bakery. We've got the cruise room and Korean war exhibit. We've got the chief's quarters and legacy center. And the cruise quarters, workshops and offices. Uh, in order to get in, you go through this small deck just under the aft rear uh, projectile. And... Uh, Oh, you can go forward or backwards if you are scared of heights. So here we are in the galley. And we've got a little bit of a, a tour and exhibit here. It's the kitchen itself, where you'd uh, plate up all your food as you're on board. Let's talk about the origins of the kamikaze. Uh, kamikaze effectively being a suicide operation where you uh, basically pilot your plane straight into the side of the ship or cause as much damage as possible to the ship via suicide. This is uh, fragments from the kamikaze aircraft that struck the side of the USS Missouri didn't do a lot of damage, uh, but it was sort of scattered. Parts of the ship was, parts of the plane was scattered across the top deck. So here you can see Harold Campbell. Uh, he was an amateur photographer, but he was the baker on board. You can see some of the pictures he's taken. Just here, and that is the kamikaze aircraft coming in. Really insane that he's managed to capture these images. We'll go careful as we come through. There's a lot of these for the airtight. The water's sealed. Again, the galley, you had potentially upwards, you had around 3,000 men on board at one point, so it's needed to be big enough to, uh, to feed all of those people. And this is talk about the christening of Missouri uh, by Harry Truman's daughter. Big Mo snack shop. So this is like a recreation of what it would have been back in the day. Single scoop of ice cream, 10 cents. Double scoop, 20 cents. Sunday, 35 cents. Popcorn, 10 cents. You got Rolos, you got Milk Duds. Uh, you got a Hershey's bar, Turkish taffy, Tootsie Rolls, Butterfinger, so quite a few that we've got now actually. Very, uh, very cheap looking at the menu. But back in the day, obviously, it wasn't cheap. So, the next room is the Chief Petty Officer Legacy Centre, and this is Chief Petty Officer George Sanderson, born in 1862. We've got a library as we come in. Hmm. Keeping them educated whilst on board. Ooh, snug. Yeah, that's a very, uh, very interestingly snug place. You imagine sitting up with night terrors in bed in there you would hit your head. So here we come in to the Chief Patty Officer's Lounge. This is obviously a little bit nicer than the standard lounge for the normal recruits on board. You've got a TV, you've got proper sofas to sit on. You've got a table to play, uh, to play poker in as well. Here you've got the galley, where they would have been preparing all the meals for the chief petty officers. It's not actually that big a kitchen, considering how many uh, officers that you need to 
feed water. We've got an interesting exhibit here of films that the Missouri featured in at some point throughout the film. This is the war room. Oh, picture. So this gives you an idea of some of the menu items that you would have had on board. Uh, dinner menu, teriyaki steak, beef barley soup, uh, lunch roast pork, simmered corned beef, mug tawny soup, and then for breakfast pancakes, grilled eggs, and hot cereal. So quite a few nice items. See how snug these World War II exhibit. Wow, remnant of Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Dredged from the harbor adjacent to Pier F5, where the USS Oklahoma and USS Maryland were moored on December 7th, 1941. Some of the, let's say, better professions, if they were on board, law, legal, all of that, warrant officers, uh, they all had their own little uh, quarters like this. So they had their own bed, lots of storage area, their own loo and sink area in there as well. So on board, you also had a full dental facility. So you had a couple of chairs, that, oh, three chairs down there. You had imaging, you had everything, you had dental prosthetics. Anything you needed to relate into dental work, you had that here. Uh, obviously you're at sea for an extended period of time. These issues arose. The United States Post Office. So you did have a postal room on board. So you still send letters to family when you're on board for extended periods. So we've got the executive officer and second in command of the ship and the right hand to the captain is in charge of all matters relating to the personnel, routine and discipline of the ship. Mm -hmm. So he's got a nice room to, all to himself. Double bed, ensuite. Yeah. Crikey. You get to the high ranks, you get your double bed. Double bed. You get your own suite as well. Very nice. The whole uh, office as well. Not bad. Supply officer. He would have had his own quarters, but not his own en suite. So yeah, a slightly larger, wider bed more storage area and desk as well. So that's our brief tour of the USS Missouri uh, and a little bit about the history of the ship itself. Uh, the last warship in commission which is a pretty cool feat that it has um, and we're gonna make our way off of here now and go and see some of the other sites that are here at Pearl Harbor. Now as I said we bought uh, the tour of Pearl Harbor ticket, that's a $90 ticket. So we do want to make full use of it, but there are a few things that still aren't included, unfortunately. So just here, you've got the USS Missouri, and basically, like here, just in Central Plain, is the Arizona. Um, the reason you can't see it is because it's under the water. Now, tragically, uh, it was struck. It was seen as a total write-off and they weren't able to bring it back up so it was just left there 
Uh, unfortunately, that is the final resting place for a great number of sailors. Uh, over here, the white building that you see is a memorial to it. Now, the Arizona and the Missouri have been stationed, so they are bow to bow. So, essentially, where that ends, you know, a few meters from that, going down that way, will be where the Arizona begins. Uh, and as I said, that is the final resting place of the ship, as well as a number of the sailors that sadly perished. So next up, we're heading into the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. So we're starting our tour in the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. We've got a audio guide here, and in order to activate the audio guide, we touch it to the language that we want on this board here. And then you just pay it to your ear like a telephone. So here, this is the Kaga. This is an aircraft carrying the Japanese military, Japanese Navy. So this is the Sword of the Samurai. And so a lot of this is Japanese aircraft and uh, about the Japanese and their attack on Pearl Harbor. So this depicts the final moments between of peace between the US and Japan. Uh, December 7th, 1941, the Japanese raid on Pearl Harbor. That was one of the greatest defining moments in American history, apparently. A uh, single stroke knocked out the Navy's battleship force as a possible threat to the Japanese Empire and southward expansion. So that brought the US into the Second World War. So here we've got battle damage aircraft. And we're just listening to the audio guy talk about these two torpedoes. Firstly, the black nosed one, which they dub Kate, and then you've got uh, the other Mark V bombs, Type 99 Mark V. Pretty crazy that those two did so much damage. So this is what the Americans dubbed the Kate. So just here we've got a depiction of the attacks on Pearl Harbor. You got the first wave that came in at 7.55 a.m. Uh, and you got the second wave that came in about an hour later. Uh, you also have the B-17, that is a U.S. operation. They were due to land around about the same time. So that's a little bit awkward. Um, the path of the Japanese was actually detected up in Upana nice. radar. Um, and they just kind of wrote it off as being B-17s, American jets. Uh, so they didn't take any action, they didn't warn anybody, and of course it ended up just being a surprise. So here we've got a replica B-25 bomber. Um, this is one of the ones that would have launched from Navy aircraft carrier um, in an effort to boost American morale and shake Japanese confidence. So Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle he trained volunteer army aircraft, air crews, sorry, to fly off the ship, find the targets, and then continue on to friendly bases in China. Um, so you had the raiders on board, and there's 16 B-25s tied to the flight deck. Um, so this was the aircraft carrier, the USS Hornet, and her task force left, left San Francisco for Japan on April 4th, 1942. Um, so this is a flight deck scene which portrays the ruptured duck pilot, Lieutenant Ted Lawson, conferring with Doolittle while en route. So on April 18th, 1942, they were still 200 miles from their planned launching point, but they decided to launch anyway, um, despite knowing that they would be low on fuel, uh, there were concerns of fuel over the distance that they had to go, etc. Um, so once they'd led their attacks, they were undamaged by Japanese defenses, but they were low on fuel. Um, one of the pilots diverted to Russia, uh, four ditched near Japanese-held Chinese coast, 11 were abandoned in the air, and three were killed outright, eight were captured by the Japanese. Three of those were executed and one of them died in captivity, so it was a big, big operation. So here we've got the USS Warhawk. You see the uh, really cool design that they've got on the front of the plane. You've got the lady on the front, you've got the mouth, the teeth. Um, there were 14,000 of these built. Uh, the first flight in 1938. 
maximum speed of 360 miles an hour and they've got a range of 650 miles. So just inside the Aviation Museum is a flight simulator, it's like a combat simulator. You jump in, you go into one of those little pods uh, and it looks really cool. Despite us getting the passport that says see everything, that's a separately ticketed thing. So nothing is clear. So heading back on the shuttle bus now, we're going to go back over to the main site and there's a few more sites over there that we can see. Also here you've got the control tower. This is quite a famous site here on Ford Island. Uh, this is where they would have been in charge of all of the aircrafts coming and going. Uh, we've also got a small fire engine there as well. Very different to the modern fire engines that we have today. So next up we're going to go into the Submarine Museum. Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum. This is included on the passport. Here we go in about the Cold War, mutually assured destruction. So World War II has ended, but the relationship between the US and the Soviet Union was tense. The Soviet Union aggressively expanded into Eastern Europe with the goal of spreading communism. Sounds familiar. This is an I-401 submarine model. Got a bell there that's been recovered from the ocean floor. So here is a depiction of how the nuclear power works on aboard the submarines. And this essentially made, the, made it possible for them to remain submerged indefinitely, uh, only having really to come up to restock for food and water supplies, things like that. Here we've got a timeline of the Cold War from 1966 to 1988. And all of the, uh, the historic things that would have happened throughout that history. This is one of the control panels or a depiction of the control panel from one of the submarines. This is the electronic control panel. And we've got another depiction of the timeline here, 1945 to 1965, Cold War. So here we've got a depiction of what the submarines may have looked like inside. Um, so you've got sort of like seating areas, you've got small galleys that are really compact and right up against the walls. Uh, and then you've also got bed areas and sleeping areas that are very similar in size and shape to the ones that we saw on the Missouri. Um, and I'm not sure if that is how it works. You have more storage underneath the mattress so you've got, you can put all your stuff there. I think that's what it is. Here you've got a replica of the control room. Which is pretty cool. So now we're sort of in modern day, we're talking about the current submarine force. The end of the Cold War marked a transition point. Political and military analysts asked, who is the enemy? Do we still need submarines? So the Navy reviewed its strategic capabilities, the numbers of submarines, patrols and missiles required. It was time to ask, how best can our fleet of nuclear submarines continue to make a difference in our global strategy? As budget cuts in the early 1990s reduced the size of the submarine force, new strategies emerged, and our submarines and their crews evolved to meet these challenges. A submerged submarine was blind without its periscope when the ship was submerged, but close to the surface the crew could raise the periscope to look for ships and planes. 
that identify him through the periscope. So these little models would help them recognize silhouettes of Japanese transport and merchant vessels. So they'd be studying these to see what they look like. Long range fleet submarines of World War II were powered by diesel electric systems. Fumes must have been incredible. Look at that, each, you had a battery array. So the diesel generators would power the batteries, which would in turn power other things on board. This is the USS Bofin, 312 feet in length and 27 feet across the 10 torpedo tubes and those torpedoes would have been the Mark 14 torpedo that you see here. So these are flags that would have signified the victories as they went further and further into enemy waters and their victories by some of the more successful submarines this is a depiction of the attacks on Japan The red dots are the submarines that were sunk, the Japanese submarines and ships. By 1945, the Japanese held territory had been significantly reduced. As you exit the Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum, you've got a gift shop just here. Each area has a gift shop. And then you've got a food truck here, Jake's food truck. You've also got some vendor machines and a jewelry shop as well. Quite a strange combination. Here. And then outside we've got a number of torpedoes as well. Mark 14 torpedoes. Uh, it wasn't until a few years into the war they realised that these had a few flaws uh, and, a few, and they weren't actually successfully hitting their targets. Eventually they realised the problem and they fixed those and it, I believe it was 1942 that's when they started actually doing real damage throughout the war. Here you go, defective torpedoes early in World War II resulted in many unsuccessful attacks. Nine duds on one, one go. Pretty crazy. So just over here to the right of the theatre and the Arizona check-in, uh, you've got the Walk of Remembrance. Uh, I'm not going to take you guys all the way over there as I feel it's a little bit disrespectful to go to Remembrance Memorial and be filming around there. Um, but it's quite a tranquil area despite helicopters going off above your head and whatnot. It is a relatively tranquil garden area. Um, just over here to the left, this is the theater, the Memorial Theater. You've got the standby line to the left and to the right, you've actually got the uh, standby and reservation line to get on the ferry to go over to the Arizona. Now, none of that is clear. None of that is clear. So uh, there's nothing to say that that is the Arizona check-in area or anything like that. It's all in the Memorial Theatre. So they need to really update their signage because people are wasting their time. There was a few people in the line that had waited for some time to get over, to get into the theatre, only to realize they're actually in the queue for the Memorial. 
So that's the end of our day here at the Pearl Harbor historic site. And uh, what can I say? Uh, personally, I feel like I've wasted $90. Um, it was a bit of a letdown. Uh, the uh, USS Blowfin was not here. They did not, uh, I think it's Bowfin actually, not Blowfin. Uh, they didn't say that to us when we purchased our tickets. Um, everything feels like nickel and dime in. The toilets are disgustingly dirty. Um, simulator is an added extra. Tower is an added extra despite the passport saying see everything. To me, see everything says you're gonna see everything, right? There's no caveats to the bottom of the signage or anything to say that there are added extras and when we went and asked them about that we were told, oh everybody knows that. Clearly, clearly they do not know that because we didn't know that. If you're gonna come, I think buy parts individually. Do not buy the passport. Okay. Um, memorial film, whilst nice and moving, um, isn't worth like the added money that should just be kind of included as part of your package, just getting into the site, really, in my opinion. Um, the Missouri, actually, the Missouri itself was fantastic. I did really enjoy that. And our guide, Heidi, she was really good. Obviously, like, she's very enthusiastic about what she does, um, and she was really knowledgeable. The facts and figures that we got from her were awesome, and being able to explore the ship as well was really cool. Um, the layout of the park and the, the, the site itself was, is just terrible as well. Um, you get a shuttle across to Missouri, and whilst you're over at Missouri, you think because you are closer to the Arizona, when you are at Missouri, you'd think that you go from Missouri to get to the Arizona when you don't you actually go from the main entrance to go to Arizona So everything's kind of coming back on yourself and you have to make a reservation to go to Arizona Otherwise, you're probably not going to get in because there's really long queues So you've got to either do it really early in the day um, Or just you know plan ahead and make yourself a reservation um, But overall, I just think if you're gonna come it's something you have to do really if you're in Hawaii, I think um, but Pick your pieces, do your research, um, and only do a couple of things. Uh, I'd recommend doing the Missouri. The submarine museum is pretty cool, but again, they're missing the uh, the main submarine at the moment. By the time the video is posted, that'll be back, um, and I don't think the ticket cost is going to change. So we've mm -hmm. just been kind of shortchanged on what we've got, unfortunately. One thing I will say as well, um, the bags policy is quite restrictive. You have to have a clear bag or no bag. Uh, if you bring a bag in they make you check it in and pay six dollars or ten dollars otherwise they tell you to put it in your car um, but there are signs in the car park saying it's a high crime area um, because people in the area know that you have to check your bags in and people do not want to pay there's no searches there's no metal detection there's no security process on the entrance um, and we're told that the reason the bags need to be checked is for security purposes. Well, if you're wanting us to check a bag, have some security procedures in place instead. It just seems like a money grab more than actual security, guys. Um, but hopefully that video has given you an insight as to whether you should come here or not and whether you should uh, pay the passport. My recommendation, no, just do it individually. Um, if you did enjoy the video throughout, give us a thumbs up. I do appreciate it. It really does help us out a lot. And I'd love for you guys to hit the subscribe button, bell icon to be notified when we post all new videos. We'll see you on the other side. Thanks.